Welcome to Interview with the Gunmaker number eight. Today I'll be talking to one of the UK gun trade's most experienced veterans, um, Mr. Brian Sorrell, who uh, started in the London trade uh, many moons ago and um, has got probably many stories to tell us. So, Brian, welcome and thank you for coming on to Interview with the Gunmaker. Much appreciated. Thank you. So, um, just tell us, where, where are you from, where were you born, and what was your childhood like? Well, I, I will go, go into it, because it was a bit of a scary start for me, because I was, believe it or not, I was born in Crawley. Well, now, you would have, it's a large town, but in those days, I was a real country bumpkin, and spending winter Saturday afternoons with my father ferreting, things like that, to subsidise the wartime rationing, <laughs> that sort of thing. I got interested in guns and that sort of thing through that. My first gun was a little nine millimeter garden gun. I don't think I ever managed to shoot anything with it, but it gave me sort of the sense to be safe with it with, under my father's charge. Uh, but I love the ferreting and things like that. And uh, that, that sort of thing, I used to get thrown into the bushes at uh, the age of probably from, from about 10 years on upwards. I think my father managed to find a smaller gun than a 12 ball for me, which was a single barrel um, 24 bore. Wow. Well, the thing is 24 bores, we couldn't get cartridges. He was a pretty practical man not in the sense of how the gun trade would work, but got a big drill and drilled the chamber out to take a 24 cartridge. <laughs> okay, so, a, lot of, a lot of that went on in those days. <laughs> that, it went on those days. I then did part-time sort of from school, bit of farming, that sort of helping out with look, cleaning out pigs and things, saved up, bought a, a, a Lang hammer gun, 12 bore, and that's, in fact, I sold it to some, a good school friend of mine, and he still got it. That, that was mainly my gun. I, I did swap it for drilling, which I really hated. Then I started at uh, Purdy's. So um, how did you um, come to get a job at Purdy's? What was your link to the, to the firm? Well, to begin with? there were no real links, actually. What it was, I failed my 11 plus, I'm afraid, but I passed, in those days, there was a, another exam that came up when you were 13 which was a technical school um, and it went from 13 to 16 and I managed to get through on that so I had I, was, I did three years at uh, Horsham Technical School which gave me an insight to a bit of bricklaying, a bit of carpentry, um, electrical, motor mechanic, a bit of everything really. Mm -hmm. Very 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 good school and I think you should have a similar now but that's my thoughts. Um, and then there was an interview at the end of it to see what I wanted to do. I think the, the board or the, 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 the committee, whatever, they, they said, well, what, what do you think you'd like to do now you come to leaving? And the, what's your first choice? My first choice was to be a taxidermist. Okay. Well, a few, a few high boys were raised and they said, I'm afraid there's not much we can do about that. Have you got a second choice? And I didn't really know much about gun making, except I was interested. And I said, be a gun maker. Well, that caused another bit of upset because they thought I was going to be a, a, a plasterer or something of that. Anyway, luckily enough, my father was a great believer in doing an apprenticeship. He served a proper apprenticeship in the motor trade on motor cars. We were talking about the turn of the century because he was... He mm. did his um, First World War, um, in the First World War, that sort of thing. So he had to make parts for, in the motor trade in those days. And he contacted the Youth Employment Agency in Oxford Street, which was quite surprising. And they had, I had a chance of two interviews immediately. One was with Atkin, Grant and Lang. I think they were Berry Street. Can't remember yeah, that. that's right, yeah. And there was a, another interview at Purdy's. And in, anyway, I turned up at the first interview, which was acting Grant and Lang, down in the depths of the cellar, there it was. 
and they were interested in taking me on, but there wasn't going to be a vacancy for about six months or so. Well, in those days, you don't, you don't have gap years and things like that. I was keen to get working. Mm. I then went to Purdy's for the interview, went to the long room, had an interview there. They said there was an opening for a stock stocker, stock maker in, at Purdy's. And my manager, I thought I'd probably want to do metal work more than wood, you know. But anyway, that was, anyway, I'm, they said, when could you start? I said, whenever. And I started about a week later. And what, what year was this? Uh, 1952. Okay. Yeah, going back a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. 1952, bearing in mind, I'd only ever been to London once prior to the interview. And it was a day up with the, when I belonged to the Scouts. And London was a scary place for me. But anyway, I took the job travelled up to London from Crawley, straight through to Victoria, catching the workman's train at half past six in the morning. Did that all the time until I did my national service. And uh, worked at Purdy's under a well-known stocker, reckoned to be the best stocker, I would go so far as to say in the world. He was brilliant. Chap by the name of my gaffer, Harold Delay. Have you heard that name mentioned? Absolutely, yeah. There were lots of delays at Purdy over the years. That's right. Well, there was Ben Delay uh, and his father, Ben Delay. Uh, yes, his father, there was a stocker, but he was a stocker at the front shop. He was getting older in those days. Mm. Uh, Harold Delay was a stocker that I was under. A very, very hard man. But he earned, if you I should mention this, I suppose, but in that Donald Dallas latest Purdy book, you'll see that his, his money was way above everybody else's. Because he, not only was he a very, very good stocker, you couldn't fault his work, mm. but fast. I remember one occasion when I was there that um, he heard his, it happens in the current trade, well, all trades probably, they'd overlock to restocker <laughs> for a customer. And it had to be done rather quickly. Yeah. And Harold stopped it, complete and utter, checkered the lot. All he had to papered up, just ready to give to the finisher to put the oil finish on in 24 hours. Wow. <laughs> he, he, and you couldn't, you couldn't fault it. You know, he was really, mm. really quite big. But what sort of age was he when you started your apprenticeship with him? And I guess he was between 45 and 50, you know. He could, that sort of, I didn't know his age. I was so naive. He was just an, an old man as far, well. And then, you say the, uh, the, the, um, the environment then was quite a tough environment for, for an old oh, I, 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 in fact, yes, I was there. Talking more or less was taboo. You know, I didn't talk. The only time I spoke, because I don't know if you've seen any pictures of the old workshop at number two Iron Gate Wharf but we worked round a well. You had a skylight that came through the whole building yeah. and, and you worked round and we was on, that's the way we worked. I was there with Harold to my, to my right, and there were other stockers in there as well. No talking virtually all day, except if I needed his help, obviously, or he was talking to me, showing me different things. And when I made the tea, for him and his brother Ben, <laughs> four times a day. Right. But it, it was, and the, the thing is, in those days, because I think I felt very lucky to have become a stocker, because I don't know if, if you know how much you know about the, the system. In those days, it's basically five men made a gun. You had a barrel filer, an action filer ejector man, stocker, and finisher. Is that five? I think it is. And the nice part about stocking, you had something like, you must, I can't quote you exact hours, but something like near a week's work preparing the gun in the white to stock it. 
you know, when it was handy to you to stop the gun, you had to file up a forehand tip, you had to do the forehand snap, that's fit the forehand bolt, that cut the loop on the barrels, um, drill the holes and make the um, horns to be able to let them on the action or let the horns on, things like that, making the breech pin. And what other jobs we did was the trigger plate was not fitted into the action. A stocker did that. You know, what? Yes, a at Purdy, you've got to do quite a lot of metal work, whereas at some firms, the stockers do a lot less, don't they? Something like, something in the region of probably nearly, I don't know, a week and a half's work before you actually, you know, started on the woodwork. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And, um, so you were, you were happy in the end that you got to, to go into stocking. You think that was a good oh, choice for you? Absolutely. I was, I was, it was, you know, a good variation to have work on wood and, and um, the metal, you know. And how, I, how, how long did it take you before you felt you were getting reasonably competent, having gone as, as an apprentice with no experience? Well, with the system, it was very So you did a oh, small sorry, amount of work. We just lost you there for a second. Can you oh, just sorry. Tell that again? Yeah, what, what used to happen, he would show me how to say let a forehand iron up on the wood. And I used to do practice runs of that lots of times before I got it perfect. Then I'd do it on a, a proper gun. You know, it was a slow build up to get it right. Hmm. You know, it, 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 it's like filing. You know, by the time I'd filed up, I don't know, 30, 40, far, uh, um, four end tips, I could file. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so yeah. you were actually getting to work on relatively minor parts of actual guns that were for sale quite quickly in your apprenticeship, were you? Yes, within, within yeah, you have to think of actual times, but um, yeah. Once I'd sort of learnt to let a four and then went straight on to a proper a, a four end and stop and then worked the way, letting in the tube, letting the ejector work and then making it off with a draw knife and that sort of thing. And, I, and then it went on to doing the stocks, that side of it. And slowly over the first year, 18 months, I got to be able to do all the letting in and that side of it. It wasn't until the second, probably something like the end of the second year that I was making off and shaping and that sort of thing. Hmm. And and, uh, you presumably had to learn at Purdy's the, the particular stock style and shape for a Purdy guns. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were doing all these jobs, I was being shown how to make the gauges. For instance, it was a gauge for the shape of the cone that you'd fit on to make sure the shape, you know, the comb on the stock and uh, not get to know all the measurements of the hand uh, and, and things like that. And the shape of the butt end, it, it's a slowly build up. Now I've made gauges for all these, you know, purdy styles and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, I made the, for instance, had to make the jig for the four end tip. You made your foot chisels, because you could only buy a certain type of chisel, the certain gouges you could buy. The other um, chisels, you made them as you went on. Harold didn't let me use his tools. I had to make my own. Mm -hmm. He showed me how to do it, how to harden them properly. And another thing you learned was the, prop the way that you sharpen a chisel for stocking is different to when you sharpen a chisel for um, a carpenter, for instance. Really? Do you know? Do you know how you sharpen a chisel for a carpenter? Not properly. I'm not. I'm not a craftsman. <laughs> I just yeah. Just well, they have two angles. Investigate and write about them, but I've got no real gun making skills. Yeah. Well, it, they've got two angles on them. You've got a, a concave angle like that, and then another one at the end, and that's the sharpened bit. The way you did it on hardwood or wood of that quality to get a lovely smooth cut, where to have a very slim 
cutting edge. It didn't last as long. You had to continually keep sharpening it, probably like a cutthroat razor. Mm. But it made a better job. And I had to make these chisels that could cut into the bottom of slots and things like that. It was what we call foot chisels. Mm. And, and so by the time you finished your apprenticeship, you more or less got all these gauges and chisels, things like that made. Yeah. You used to have to make spring clamps. Okay. Like your own spring clamp. <coughs> One for a top lever spring and one for a main spring, things like that, which is all you know, good experience and finding for a start. Yeah, sure. no machines. So, um, Purdy stock shapes are particular, aren't they? The, the, the various shapes of the, the pistol grip stocks and the semi pistol stocks and the, um, and the straight hand stocks. And one of the things that really gives away a Purdy that's been stocked by somebody. Um, who might be a competent woodworker but doesn't really understand purdy shapes is 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 quite crucial, isn't it? You, it the, oh. the shape of the stock, the layout of the checker, everything is very peculiar to a purdy. Can you just talk a bit, little bit about that style? Yeah. Well, the the, sh the shape you've got to, it's it, the shape. As I say, you used to make these gauges to give you the right shape. Um, purdy's, I think. Some other gun makers reckon they were more like cricket bats than, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, because Purdy stocks are sort of more rounded. You'll see some other gun makers, their stocks are very, very slim. Mm -hmm. um, Purdy's had their own, I can't say why they decided that, but in their wisdom, that was the, the way it was done. The checkering, it, they had lovely lines in their checkering, the way that was laid on. Um, fairly fine checkering um for instance on the beaver tail four ends that was quite a nightmare to checker because there's lots of checkering and, and they were getting quite popular in your time were they because you had lots of american orders yeah lots of them yeah so it was a lot of always always busy all the t although i've read the purdies were having a bad time i think during the 50s it it, it it didn't appear to be with me, I must admit, because we always had, there was a lot of gun makers there. I think it was about 50 people there. And so can you remember any of the, um, the stories? It's a little hard. Can you remember any of the stories that your, uh, your old gun makers told you from what it was like in the old days, or did they just not, not talk much about that? Well, the funny part about it, the, the thinking about the old stories, I got an idea that the, the, when I came into it, the times hadn't changed a lot. It wasn't until you got to sort of the middle of the 50s that sort of started getting more modern technology. And we were working on the same system that they were doing probably 50 years before. Yeah. For instance, the bonus system. I think the one before it was piecework. We were on bonus, but piecework was if you didn't get the job done, you didn't get paid. And, and I've heard stories since where people say, bonus doesn't work, you turn out bad, um, bad uh, quality. But I didn't notice any of that in those days, I must admit. Mm. The quality is, was very, very good. There were occasional hiccups, but generally speaking, there was still pride in the work. Well, a lot of the people that were working there in the 50s would have been there in the 30s and 20s when people talk about Purdy's, you know, these days, a lot of collectors consider guns built in the 20s and 30s to be the pinnacle of a lot of Purdy's work, where, of course, a lot of those chaps were still there. Yeah, they were. In fact, um, I just, in fact, I was checking on dates when I was there, because I couldn't remember exactly, and there's a, a big photograph I've got of 1933, the action shop working round in this well I was talking about, we mm. called it a well. And I looked through the names there, and I reckon 40% of them were there when I started in 1952. Right. I'll tell you one occasion we had, there was a chap by the name, action filer, by the name of Maury Timbers, mm -hmm. an action filer. I don't know how old he was, but he was, above retirement age, but they still wanted him to come into work. And he used to arrive at Edgware Road Station, which was just across the road from where 
Purdy's was in Edgware Road. <clears throat> and there was a, another gun maker there by the name of Frank Hurst that had a motorbike and sidecar. I don't know how they didn't have mo <laughs> mobile phones in those days, but he was obviously very regular and came out of the station at the same time. They used to go, take the motorbike and sidecar, we're only talking about several hundred yards away, drive outside of the um, Edgware Road underground station. Murray Timbers used to get in, they'd drive into the factory, he then sit on the steps because he had to go up one flight, get his breath back. And they did that to keep him working there. Right. Um, you know, he, he was an action filer and he was up there for SEMA or something of that, you know. And, yeah. and it seemed to me that the terrible thing was what used to happen, somebody, somebody was missing, of course. They didn't retire particularly, whether they couldn't afford to or whether they didn't want to, who knows. But uh, yeah. It, it was a little different. I think for a lot of the, that generation, that, you know, guys like that that had been coming into the same bench for the last 50 years, they pro it was probably what they liked. What they liked. You know, it was their life, really, and, and there's such a routine that I can imagine that once they stopped doing that, they didn't know what to do with themselves. I mean, I didn't retire until I, well, I still do a certain amount, but I didn't, I went into semi-retiring when I was 80. Mm. Because I, <laughs> You know, it's, it's habit forming. I didn't dislike the job or anything like that. You know, but, you know, so I carried on. It is one of those jobs that you can carry on for a long time as long as you've got your eyesight and you can stand at a bench. Yeah, I find it. I must admit, it's beginning to get more difficult now. I must admit, but I used to do, for instance, I moved on from Perth after came out of the National Service, did two or three years there. Uh, how long? Moved, how long were you at Perth in total before you moved up, moved on? Um, about 12 years. Yeah. And yeah. do you remember any particular guns from that period that stood out as being particularly uh, interesting or were they all very similar? Um, fairly yeah, similar as different. We used to make these single barrel trap guns. Yeah. Uh, the Amer it was, American market was the main, the main, um, yeah, I think most, just trying to think, because there was people like, made them for Khrushchev, made them for all these people, that was quite incredible. Those, uh, those single barrel trap guns have something of a cult following now. I was talking to a friend recently who'd been and tried and, and shot one, and um, it's one of those experiences where he felt he couldn't miss, and he said, if I ever, one of these ever turns up on the market, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember the... There were so many that uh, there, there were just guns going through all the time, mm. and the only um, particular um, type of stocking I didn't enjoy doing, and that was bolt action rifles. Right. We did a few sort of Mauser ninety eight type ri <clears throat> rifles. It, I didn't enjoy that work at all. I must admit, um, but generally speaking, I enjoyed the whole. You know. And um, what was the quality of the walnut you were getting? Well, it's very different to what you see now. You jogged my memory on something there, because in fact, when I first started there, I was struggling because it was quite close to being after the war. Mm. And uh, the walnut quality, as far as figure, the walnut was all right, but the quality of figure was terrible. And um, they used to try and they used uh, coal ron to try and put different colours in. And we joked about them. Some of them ended up looking like uh, pillar boxes and things like that because they just couldn't get the wood. I mean, it was really, really bad. Um, but generally speaking, because Purdy's felt, that was one of their excuses, that they felt that um, straight grain is stronger. <laughs> Which is fairly true, in fact. Yeah. yeah. Far fewer yeah. shakes and far fewer things for it to, to things to go wrong, but there is a there is an aesthetic compromise there. Yeah. But these pages, people, they don't have to. Say, the gun trade's changed tremendously, in my opinion. People, um, they seem to have. Uh, as, as long as the wood looks really, really fancy, that's all you need. You know, I, I find it. 
it's different. Yeah, I better be careful what I say because I'm not so keen on the, what, what the choices well, are. I always think with guns that, you know, whether it's the, well, yeah, the, when I'm doing up guns, whether it's the Damascus pattern and the color that you go with, the, with on the Damascus barrels, whether it's the, the checker, whether it's the stock figure, whatever you're doing, I think the whole thing has to work in symmetry so it all looks part of, the, of, a, of a whole rather than individual parts of it jumping out and shouting at you. And I think, I think that's lost on a lot of people these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that um, they get a little bit too heavy. It almost takes your eye away from the actual quality of the gun. Mm. You know, because I was there lucky enough also because you've obviously heard of Ken Hunt, have you? Absolutely, yes. I've corresponded with Ken a few times. Yeah, well, Ken was apprentice with me as well. He was a few months old. I can't remember it happening now. But um, but he he was something else in the gun trade because nobody was actually um, doing the engraving that he was doing in those days. He was experimenting all the time. He was just devoted. That's all he thought about. And I told a funny story once that uh, talking about Ken because he, he used to be with... Um, can't remember his Christian name, but Cal, who was the engraver that taught Ken Hunt, he he, he worked for himself and then subcontracted. <laughs> Harry Cal. Yeah. Yeah. He, he he spent some time at Purdy's, didn't he? Yeah. Well, he 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 taught Ken Hunt actually, mm -hmm. and he used to do work for for Purdy's. Anyway, Cal either passed on, or, but Ken en ended up with his own little shed in the factory, if you like to keep him separate from too much of the noise. And uh, it was a time when he was doing a lot of really deep, really deep carving out. And um, he had obviously worked something out and he had a, a bucket, must have been plastic, I should think, bucket of water, so-called, in his workshop. And what it was, without anybody knowing, he used to cover it with wax, the action, and inscribe out different areas and put the action in the bucket of this, uh, probably sulfuric would it be, to, to eat the metal away, to cut away some of the hard work. Oh, really? So he, I mean, he was pushing his luck, you know, <laughs> but he, he did things like that, you know. If it works, so, it's all right. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he yeah. But he, he was an incredible worker. He could go, oh, he could engrave work. People buy Ken Hunt engraved guns now purposely, don't they? Because That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think uh, somebody told me that at one point he got so well, so much in demand that almost one in three birdies that were being ordered were being ordered with Ken Hunt engraving, which of course was a problem for the um, production line because. He, he could only engrave at a certain rate, whereas the factory could actually produce guns faster. Exactly. Uh, he, I've got a collar uh, uh, here that Dave Trebalian put together with samples of his, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, with the, on this, this picture, if you like, or different pictures of Ken Hunt's engraving. It's an, it's a, how he did that amount of work, I just don't know. Unbelievable. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's the body of, body of work there. So you stayed at Purdy, then you went off and did national service and came back again. Then came back to Purdy's. I then, um, it ended up after a few years, I, well, I met somebody. <laughs> and the marriage was on the cards. And I must admit, it changed me from wanting to go backwards and forwards to London. We weren't interested in living in London, I think, uh, although I enjoyed working there. The traveling and the, that type of living wasn't quite for us. And I've been doing, over the years, quite a lot of moonlighting, you know, to earn a little bit of extra money and that sort of thing. In fact, it was getting a bit serious. You know, I was working at Purdy's, going home, had a little shed at home, working on stocking and lengthening and different things like that. And um, one of the persons that I did a lot of work for offered me a job and I took it. So I did 12 years with a company called John Powell in Rygate. Right. You've heard? Yeah. Yeah. So I did that for 12 years. I learned a lot 
of the different side of the gun trade, I must admit. So that would have been a lot of restocking and refurbishment work, would it? Uh, he, we, he, he brought in, Unanimera was one gun, a lot of guns in the white from Spain, and I used to reshape all the stocking and and it started with number one of these things. And they're making reasonable money actually now. They got quite well known. Or oh, another little job I did actually during my moon, moonlighting day, and I only got paid for half the job, was um, I did all the guns up for Zulu. All, the film the all, those, all those Martini Henrys, must have been a couple of hundreds. I, I refurbished all the exterior really and it went in that gun with what's his name baker and whoever that and well known. michael kane yeah that's the one yeah i think yeah, they, they were all, they were all old they were genuine um army yes. rifles that came into you and then they yeah. went out in fully full full working order did they or did you have to to uh, do any mechanical work to decommission is it is it going i can't hear um, those uh, those rifles must have been um, ex-military stock then, and they um, they went out to the film set in full working order, did they? Yeah, yeah. They were they were Martini Henrys. Yes. Yeah, Martini Henrys. And I did did. In fact, I took two weeks holiday and worked every hour going for two weeks on those. And I did them for a chap I used to leave Purdy's in the evening sometimes, and go and work in Lisson Street for Bill Roper. Right, he, those, he those Martini Henrys, they were firing, they were just firing normal blank charges in those, were they? They were fully working rifles. They were working rifles, yeah. I, 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 I don't, can't answer that side of it, but they, they fired, mm. you know. And, and you did about 200 of those? Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> did you get to meet any of the actors? No, I didn't get involved with anything other than doing the work. Right. But as you, when, you, when you see the film, you always think every one of those oh, yeah. has been through your hands. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That the sad part is that film probably made a lot of money, but I only got paid for half of it. <laughs> That's a shame. Yeah. That's a shame. <laughs> there we go. And of course, I did a lot of the game fairs and things like that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been pretty good to me. Did you ever have an apprentice of your own? This is a sad part, actually, because I didn't, because I was probably not, I'm good at actually working, I worked every hour, but I probably wasn't that good at making sure the financial, because I couldn't turn work down. And I used to get myself into, I was always up to there in work, but always trying to chase the money side of it. So like, I can't grumble, I've done all right. <laughs> I, I've never known a self-employed gun maker that turns away work. They always, they always think the next job will be the last one they get. <laughs> I've, got, I've stopped punt guns, I've stopped double rifles. I'll give you one example. I'm not rabbiting on too much, am I? <laughs> one, one example, in fact, I took my son. I, I had a, a Holland and Holland Paradox that I had to reprove and restore for an American client when I had East Coast guns. And uh, anyway, I got it proofed, put it all together. And I thought, oh, what's going on here? This is a bit loose. And realized there was a big crack in the stock. And I thought I'd broken the stock. I don't know how. Anyway, it calls me a few sleepless nights thinking, what do I do now? Anyway, I decided, it'd been waiting some time for the job to be done anyway, and I decided to do a long weekend in, um, I can't remember where it was, in, anyway, in America. I took a long weekend and delivered it. And when I got it to him, they really looked after me well, showed me these gun clubs and things they did, all this gun collection. Turned out that he knew it was broken. <laughs> I didn't. So I restocked it for nothing and just took yeah. it over. But um, at least one of you was happy. <laughs> well, it made me feel better. But there yeah. we go. <laughs> so um, you've been in the gun trade a very long time. Um, who else have you worked with or um, whose work have you seen that you've 
you've particularly admired over the years? Uh, well, obviously, well, you know, you've spoken with him, actually. A very, very good actual father and gun maker there. Sorry, I mean, some... you just froze out for a second. Right. Sorry? We just lost you for a second. Can you... Oh, did you? Didn't get that. It may be because my mainline phone rings. Sometimes that cuts. Maybe. Um, Pete Nelson made very, very good guns. He was a bit of a perfectionist, and I think he, if he sees this, he'll be upset with me. But I went and saw him, but I think he was very hard to please. <laughs> he, he told me the same. Sorry? He told me that himself. Yeah, oh, he did. Oh, yeah. right. Okay. Um, he was very good. And I, I shared a bed set with Otto Weiss. He mm -hmm. was another... I mean, I knew Otto when he first came to Purdy's because he escaped from um, East Germany and got to Switzerland and then came to Purdy's. And I shared a um, bed set with him in Holland Park at one time. Right. And uh, But he was difficult as well because he got upset with me for leaving too much rubbish around the flat. <laughs> um, who else? Job to think suddenly of all these nice guns. But, but uh, yeah, I'm going quiet now. I'm trying to think what else, how we we'll cover this one. Uh, there's one gun out there I'd like to find again that I made. Oh, really? And I, I inherited, and it was on the style of a um, Churchill. It was the type of Churchill that had an enclosed mainspring in the side lock. And I, the, I had, action, the, the 1220 I got, I got in 1220. Yeah. Anyway, I had a chap who used to work with me called Les Paul. He, he was apprenticed to um, Atkin, Grant and Lang. Mm -hmm. And I took this job on because um, a person by the name of Des Mills, who was an action filer at Purdy's at one time, he was a bit older than me. He obviously may have bitten off more he could choose, but he asked me if I'd finish the gun off. So I inherited, couldn't turn it down, took it in in the white, took me six years to finish it. And I, 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 I made it for a man up in um, Yorkshire. Anyway, I got in a car when I finished it and drove it up there. And we shot it on his little river bank that he lived on. Very good. But sometime after that, um, he had a ricochet on one of the um, dry stone walls and he lost his right eye really? and couldn't shoot it again because he needed a cross eyed stop. Mm. But I'd like to see that gun again one day. It's not got my name on it. He had it with a flag, that like curled flag on the side and left it clear in case he wanted to name it one day. So it just had an empty banner? Yeah, a banner, that's it. Yeah, interesting. There's a, there's a gun out there somewhere that you built with an empty banner on it. And it's got the enclosed, I think they called it a 1220. Yeah, that's right. It's a 1906 Baker patent. Yeah, but it was a bit of a nightmare because you couldn't get enough power on the springs, to the, the, because they're little tiny main springs, to actually fire the cartridge. And anyway, I did it in the end. But that, that, but it has got EGG in a stamp mark on the barrels under the fore end. <laughs> okay, something for people to watch out for. Um, yeah. you, you've mentioned the gun trade's changed a lot in your time here. What do you yeah. notice about the way people are building guns now that's different? And what well, do you think about that? I, um, I, when I left Purdy's, I, I had a struggle to be able to even go in and see some old friends still, they more or less, because I can understand now, I'd been trained up, they spent a lot of money on me, although I didn't get paid a lot, um, learned the trade and then left, mm. you know, so I can understand, I understand that. But for my 80th birthday, my um, daughter and my son, they arranged a, um, a walkabout at Purdy's, and I did it around about my 80th. And I went along to the factory as well as the front shop. 
In fact, as you go up the stairs in the front shop, there's a picture with me in it with two or three other people actually, which I was quite pleased to see. Anyway, we went over to the new factory at Hammersmith with all this super duper machinery. I mean, you know, we had nothing like that. Didn't even know a bandsaw, we cut everything out with a hacksaw on its side. Anyway, um, and, and I was interested, and they told me they only make about the same amount of guns there now as they did in 1952, about 70 guns a year or somewhere there. Yeah. And for us to make a Rose and Scroll standard Purdy in 1952 ish, it was about 700 hours. And he laughed at me, he said, well, it takes us 800 hours now. <laughs> Isn't that pretty incredible? And, and the investment is just, well, I don't understand it. I think we're going to upset people. <laughs> well, I guess the thing with machines is that once you've invested in a machine, it doesn't leave you and go and set up on its own. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. I find it difficult because I'm, I'm not, I know nothing about machines. I can just about use a lathe. But, um, you know, I've got a bandsaw myself. But yeah. even in that, when I was there, we didn't have a bandsaw. So we didn't even profile the worst part of the stock out. We used to do it with a hacksaw with a, a more, a less teeth to the inch and put the hacksaw on its side so you could cut down it. Um, unbelievable. I'd have it with draw knife off. So when you're looking at the stockers at Purdy's now and the, and the way where they start their job and where you started your job, you can see a few differences. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of difference. Yeah. But um, I, I tell another funny story about Purdy's while I was there. Just suddenly thought of it. <clears throat> they used to do, obviously, restoration for people. And, and sometimes guns were passed down. So the stock measurements were different. Mm. So we used to do things like setting them. Uh, do you know how they bend stocks roughly? What, when, what, for resetting them when, when they need to be done for somebody else using hot yeah. linseed oil and light the lamps, yeah. That's right. Well, what used to happen at Purdy's at number two, on the lower floor, the ground floor, was the barrel filers. And there was a big forge down there. And of course, when you do that setting, it smells something rotten. It fills the whole place out. We didn't have things like fans and extractor pans and things like that <clears throat> and what happened was you used to have to wrap the stock um, with um, cloth and things which soaked with linseed oil wrapped you around the stock put it in the vice to hold it the man doing the setting frank hurst actually i mentioned him earlier he used to have some long rods iron rods and the, on the end of the iron rods were big lumps of metal that went into the forge. These were heated up to be red hot. He then took them out of the forge, which was downstairs, yelled out coming through, and he used to run up three flights of stairs to get to the top of the factory with the windows open and just go under and above, under and below to heat up the lucid oil to be able to bend the stock. <laughs> That was health and safety came into they it. They love that. <laughs> the other thing we had at number two was we had these blow pipes where you're down in the office where they viewed the guns and handed out guns to the gun makers in different floors. And uh, there's a pipe with a whistle in it. Have you ever seen these where they take the whistle out, you blow in it, the, whistle, the pipe upstairs has got a, a whistle, you take the whistle out, and listen down the pipe. No, I've never tried one of those. Yep, they got up. My son reckons they got those in, used to have in ships and things. I don't know. But we had that at Purdy's for that. <laughs> Distant times. Yeah, very different. Um, so, how do you think of the gun trade today? I mean, do you think it's a good, still a good thing for a youngster to want to get involved in to be a gun maker? I, uh, uh, it's, I, I find it so different that I find it difficult to explain really because I found that people bought a Purdy because it was almost unique, handmade right the way through. Now, in my opinion, it's almost coming off a conveyor belt. 
there's a lot less, I'm surprised there's a lot less um, individual work going in and, and I suppose therefore a lot less individual variation from one gun to another. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it, I'm not very, I can't think what my mind tells me, but I'm glad I went into the traders role as I did because I, I've, I've learned so much, so much through it, it's untrue. In fact, changing from going from Purdy's to somebody like John Powell, he taught me things that probably I shouldn't have been taught, but that was just to try and earn money, but yeah. there we go. But he, he made one mistake. I was with him for eight years, then I set up on my own. I was with him for eight years, and he had a client that came in from the abroad somewhere, and he took the client in, introduced him to me, the rest of it, and John said, me listening, this is Brian, he's other, he's been with me for 10 years, he'll be with me for the rest of his life. And I thought, you don't tell him, say that to me, you know. And I, within a year, I decided to set up on my own. Right. My job, so much private work then that I was struggling to cope. Yeah, good, I've, I, I, good gun maker's never going to be short of work, particularly with all the restoration work. Now, you, you must have worked on a lot of different types of guns oh, over, the, over the years. What sort of guns have you, do you particularly like? I mean, you've worked with hammer guns and box locks and all different makers. I, uh, yeah, different makers. I've seen so many beautiful guns, you know, really, some really early hammer guns. I, I sort of lose track of them because I've been out of that sort of thing for a few years now. But going back to the sort of six, late 60s, I, I rented a big workshop and there was four of us doing full-time repairs there. And we had so much work coming in from places like people up to Paul Roberts and a few others, Cannon and a few of these people, bringing stuff in from India. And we was getting all these lovely double rifles and that's right, they were clearing out the Maharaja's collections in those days, weren't they? Simon Claude and Hugh Kennedy and people like that were going over and bringing a lot back. Uh, we was backwards and forwards to the proof house every week. Those days you could go to the proof house and hand it in on a Monday, Monday and then it, go the following Monday with others. They'd all be done for you. Nowadays it's, it's entirely, that's changed tremendously. Yeah. I avoid the proof house like the plague now. <laughs> trouble is the whole country's going to hear me saying that. I'm going to be in trouble, except I'm probably too old to worry about it. <laughs> it becomes a point where you can say what you like. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit that way, I must admit. Yeah. But uh, no. Yeah, they, just, they brought some amazing stuff back from India in those days, didn't they? Oh, it's unbelievable. unbelievable. I tell you what I was given what to do once, so I got a little bit of trouble. Um, I can't remember a lot, two or three hundred of Mauser 98s that were found, that were made in Brazil, I think, and they were absolutely mint condition, absolutely superb, all in their grease, they've been in their grease boxes in storage for years and years, and they, uh, anyway, they were brought in to me, um, I think it was about 200 of them. Absolutely superb. And I had to rechamber each one to make them instead of, do you know, December 57 is a standard military. That's right, and it's what I shoot my deer with. Oh, really? Well, these were, these were December 57, standard military caliber, but you couldn't sell them in a lot of countries because the military caliber, France, for instance, and so we converted all of them to December 64. So we rechambered for, for a company, rechambered these for all 70, 64. And we was taking bunches of them up to the proof house. And they were, they were so good, lovely colouring on the action, on the sights, with beautiful blues and lovely. And the proof house, they liked them coming up because they enjoyed you shooting. They used to just shoot them for fun in the proof house with those. I'm talking about probably in the 60s, maybe in the early 70s, but going back a long time. Anyway, I was coming back one day and I had an old um, Rover 2000 in those days. And uh, had them in the back. Anyway, police stopped me. 
I was going through the city, police stopped me and called me over and said, oh sir, um, what have you got in your vehicle? Because obviously it was like that, you know, and I, and I thought, well, I can't argue, I told him, they said, well, just don't take so many in the future. It was ridiculous. And that was, due, I've got an idea, that was during the Irish problems. Yeah. But it, it did, didn't worry. Because it's funny, that, that connected up again. I had to meet an American client at uh, Park Lane, so I can't remember which hotel it was now. Anyway, I went in there, this was the Irish bro. I had a double gun in a case and went into the foyer and the security bloke came up to me, what have you got there, sir? So I told him and I wanted to see a certain person and um, his room number and everything. Oh. He said, um, right, uh, have you got any ammunition with it? I said, no, 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 just, just to go and see. He said, oh, could you hang here? I'll get my superior to come and see. We're not going to turn around and run out, you know, if it was a problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, there we go. Well, uh, Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. So thank you very much. I could go on forever, but we're, we're almost at the hour mark now, and I'd pencil oh. 40 minutes. So I think we've got a great amount of material there, and I'm very grateful you, grateful to you for taking the time to talk to people uh, like me, because I think it's going to be very interesting for the, the viewers to um, to hear all about your exploits in the gun trade. Well, it's a different side of things. <laughs> very much so. Well, enjoy the sunshine, and thank you so much. All right, thank you. Bye. -bye.